So let's open our Bibles to Matthew chapter 26. Lord, once again, we pray that you would do what only you can do. May this message strike the chord that it needs to in each one of us. Uh, we ask for your work corporately, but also individually. Give us ears to hear and the humility to receive. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So as we closed out chapter 25, Jesus had just given an end times overview to a couple of his disciples on the Mount of Olives. And with that, as we finish that, we have reached the end of the teaching and preaching ministry of our Lord. With Passover just a couple of days away, Jesus will soon be fulfilling the key part of his mission that he came for, and that is the cross. Remember, Jesus didn't come to give us a code of ethics, right? Following the golden rule will never save anybody. Jesus didn't come to be one of many in some line of enlightened masters. As you find so many isms and teachings put Jesus on their pantheon of superstars, if you will. Jesus excluded them when he said in John 14, 6, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And nobody comes through the Father except through me. Those are his words. So that's either true or he's not a good teacher. He didn't come to make us feel better about ourselves or to give us lessons on self-esteem. He didn't come to fuel some mystical speculation so we can pontificate philosophical speculations and nuances and think we're be so shallow because we think we're deep. We can be wise in our own eyes that way. He didn't come just to be the paragon of virtue. He came to save sinners. That's what he said. He said, the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which is lost. And if you miss that, well, then you miss everything. Well, now that he spent the last two chapters explaining the end of the age, he's going to bring his disciples back to the present. For they are in the midst of a crazy week with the highest of highs and the lowest of lows. So chapter 26, verse 1, Now it came to pass when Jesus had finished all these sayings, he said to his disciples, You know that after two days is the Passover, and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. Now as you know, the Passover is the Jewish feast that celebrates uh, God's deliverance of Israel from the slavery of Egypt. And you don't have to be a, a believer to know that. Just, you know, I saw the movie. Right? <laughs> On the first Passover, the families, each family sacrificed a lamb and covered their doorpost and the lentil with the blood of the lamb. And then the angel of death would pass over their houses as it killed all the firstborn of Egypt. So when it would come, if it saw the blood, then death would pass over. Jesus will die on the Passover. He is the Lamb of God. Right? That's what John the Baptist declared. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So he will die for our sins, so the judgment of God will pass over us. We won't be judged for our sins, for he, the blameless one, took that upon himself. For he was the Lamb sacrificed in our place. Now, He'd been telling his disciples ever since they realized he was the Messiah back in chapter 16. He'd been telling them that he was going to be delivered up into the hands and he would be crucified. But unfortunately, they didn't seem able to connect the dots. They had the information, but it was just kind of too unreal to accept this fact. He said it several times. Well, there he goes again. I don't know why he keeps saying that. What do you think he means by that? I don't know. Sometimes we don't ask questions when we know we're probably not going to like the answer. 
So I think that sometimes it's easier to not know the truth so we think we don't have to deal with the truth. It's like, I don't know what he means by that, but <laughs> let's just leave that one alone. But he keeps saying it. And it seems that this is something that they quickly forgot. Not remembering, uh, uh, understanding Jesus' own predictions of his death they, until after the resurrection. They're probably thinking it's, you know, it's some sort of parabolic thing. And it's worth noting that Jesus is linking the time of his death to the Passover. For that was the plan. He is the fulfillment of what Passover foreshadows. That's the plan. Now, for you conspiracy freaks out here, I'm going to let you in on the biggest conspiracy of all time. There is a cosmic conspiracy, and God himself is in on it. And he has been on it from the beginning. Although conspiracy is not really the right word, because uh, conspiracy has kind of a negative connotation to it. You've got the con, which means to uh, be against. So it's more like a cosmic collaboration. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit are working together and they are going to complete this plan of redemption. It's in the works. And therefore, He is the one who will choose the details for the plan. Right down to the time, right down to the place. The interesting thing is that, that we just, sometimes we act as if we don't know this. And a lot of times people don't understand that it's God's plan is unfurling. We think we know what we're doing. Remember Caesar Augustus? The most powerful man in the known world issuing a decree so everyone has to register to be taxed. Well, God was in on that one too, right? Unbeknownst to Caesar, but that's how he got Mary and Joseph to Bethlehem where Jesus was to be born as it was written years ago. And if you ever start studying the scriptures from that perspective, it really becomes a hoot because you end up seeing God's fingerprints and thumbprint all through history. People like to think they're in control, but it simply isn't the case. Now, according to God's great plan, the time and the place of the crucifixion is settled. It's going to be at the Passover. It's going to be on Mount Moriah. Because Jesus is going to fulfill the Passover. Because that's the way it works. I think it's significant. He's pointing this out. And the, now, these first two verses are like the opening scene. But now we're about to shift the scene. But these two opening verses really set the mood for the rest of the chapter. The clock is ticking. Passover is just around the corner. So now we shift to scene two. It's a brief one as well. It, it's, it's only three verses. Meanwhile, so what we're going to do now is we're going to call your attention to see who the ones who think they are running the show. We're going to see what they are doing, right? Already in progress. Then the chief priests, the scribes and the elders of the people assembled at the palace of the high priest, who was called Caiaphas, and they plotted to take Jesus by trickery and kill him. Now, the plot to kill Jesus was nothing new at this point. We saw it as far back as chapter 12 and verse 14. But now the, the chief priests, the scribes, they're, they're plotting the, er, the murder of an innocent man. And they're willing to take him by deceit, by trickery. So much for their fear of God. So they're scheming, but they have a problem. Verse 5, but they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar among the people. So once again, the real issue is the fear of man, not the fear of God. If the issue is the fear of God, then they wouldn't be scheming and plotting to kill an innocent man by trickery. The real issue is what everyone else is going to think. It's the fear of man. The Passover season is coming. There's going to be so many people in Jerusalem. It's interesting how often we as Christians make that same mistake. 
where it's the fear of man becomes why we do what we do. Let's say you have a, a little lapse of integrity. Uh, you, you, you fell down. You did something you know you shouldn't have. Maybe somebody gave you too much change and you're like, oh, and you didn't return it. Or maybe you got caught up in uh, a little bit of gossip. You know, somebody started talking about something about somebody and it was just so juicy and you, once you heard a little bit, you, you, you wanted to hear the end. And, and the next thing you know, you're, you're caught up in it. Or maybe it was a, a dis indiscretion. Isn't that a nice word? It makes it sound like an accident. Maybe it was a youthful indiscretion. Maybe it was a white lie. Maybe it was lost. But, but let's just say no one noticed. So we're like, whoo. So not really a big deal, right? Wrong. You see, you mean to tell me that if someone else did notice, then it would be an issue? You see how it works? The fear of man. What about God? He noticed. But we were okay with that. Like the example I often say is if your name came up on the screen behind me and every na nasty thought that you had this week came up there and everyone was looking at it, this would probably be your last time at Calvary Chapel Sunrise. <laughs> But you, <laughs> but you were okay with it until everyone else found out about it. But what about God? You see what I'm saying? The fear of man. So, let's not do it in front of the people. right? There's going to be a lot of people and some of them are going to be his followers. So, this is how we're going to do it. Isn't it funny how we think we, we can do what we want with Jesus? Like This is the way we're going to deal with Jesus. This is the way... This is the authority Jesus is going to have in my life. I'm going to be in control of this. It, I mean, they think they're in control, but actually it's Jesus who will call the shots as he fulfills the Passover. In fact, when he tells Judas, do what you must, you know, what you do, do quickly, um, Jesus actually forces the hand and puts the timing on his timetable. He has a way of doing that. He's very good at unmasking us. You see, if everybody around you is buying what you're selling, then you start believing you're okay too. <laughs> but Jesus has a way of just going right to the issue, doesn't he? It's like he'll push on that bruise and when you light up, it'll be like, oh, we've got a little sensitive area there, don't we? Remember the Samaritan woman? She's chatting with Jesus at the well. Oh, she's well acquainted with dealing with men. It took a little while, and then all of a sudden the mask is ripped off. And as a result of that, though, God is glorified. She brings a whole bunch of people to Jesus. David, same thing. Right? Burying his sin, making believe it's not an issue. Nathan the prophet comes up, and when he says, you to man, he didn't mean it in a good way. Saul, it comes up over, God just has a way of doing that in our lives. Just kind of shaking up our snow globes so we realize we're not the ones in control of our little world. He has a way of getting to the heart of things. But some of us are really good at distractions. Some of us are really brilliant in our, in our diversionary tactics for a little while. The priests and the scribes, they're going to change their plans again when Judas is going to show up with an offer that they can't refuse. And when they end up turning Jesus over to the Roman authorities at that point, then they lose control over when Jesus will die and he will die on the Passover as it is meant to be. It will happen at the time and the place of God's choosing, not theirs. Now, our third scene here, the, the next shift, it starts here in verse 6. And when Jesus was in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, so the setting of the scene is worth noting. Bethany is the town where Jesus, I'm not Jesus, Lazarus, Martha, and Mary lived, and apparently Simon the leper. It's about two miles east of Jerusalem. It's, it's actually, if you're in Jerusalem, you go over the Mount of Olives on the other side down, and uh, there it is. It's up there. And so that's where he would stay. And then he would 
go from there and he'd commute to Jerusalem for that week. Perhaps it wasn't safe for him to stay with his disciples in Jerusalem. My guess is Simon the leper is one of many who had been healed by Jesus. And perhaps he kept the title as a testimony of what Jesus has done. It would have been unlawful to eat with a leper, according to the law of Moses. And according to the law, a leper would have to live outside of the city. So, I tend to believe that he was one of the many lepers that was healed by Jesus and was grateful. And when Jesus came by, he was more than happy. So that's where he is. And verse 7 says, A woman came to him having an alabaster flask of very costly fragrant oil. And she poured it on his head as she sat at the table. Now, you need to understand a little bit about the culture. Otherwise, that's just weird, right? I mean, if I'm at your house and all of a sudden you come up being like, <laughs> right? So you need to understand this. There was a way of honoring somebody. And he anoints him with this very costly oil. She anoints him with this very costly oil. Now, who was this woman? Well, we know from John's Gospel, chapter 12, that this was Mary. Now, what, there's a lot of Marys. This was the sister of Lazarus and Martha. She makes a, an extravagant gesture of love and devotion. This is not the same woman who did this in Luke chapter 7. And I say this because, bless you, a lot of times things happen more than once in the Gospels. Right? Jesus cleaning out the temple. There's two separate accounts. Jesus feeding the multitudes. A lot of times there's events that happen more than once. And it's very easy to confuse them and come up with supposed contradictions. When and certainly an event happened more than once. Now, it's one thing to anoint a guest with a little bit of fresh oil. But this is very extravagant. As we look at John's Gospel and in Mark's Gospel, we find that this was spikenard. It's a specially scent of oil. It was extracted from the root of the plant that was grown in India. It has this beautiful fragrance. You see, back then, spices and ointments were used as investments. And it makes a lot of sense. No pun intended. But, uh, you know, they're carried in a small little portable bottle. They could easily be sold. They're very costly and expensive, so you could have some of this and, and it could be your future. And expensive oils were often in, in these little alabaster flasks. The design of this bottle, we see in Mark chapter 14 in verse 3 that this bottle, it had to be broken. So it's like, this is it. And the beautiful fragrance inside cannot be released until the container is broken. But when it is broken, and the contents are poured out upon Jesus, John chapter 12, verse 3 tells us the whole house was filled with the fragrance of this perfume. Mary's act of worship here is an example of being broken and being poured out. See, that's what true worship really is, being broken and poured out before God. David said in Psalm 51, 17, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Isn't it weird how so often we think we gotta get it together before we go before God? Isn't that weird? As if you're going to make yourself blameless and presentable before a holy God. It doesn't work that way. We need to understand that truth. For it says, a broken and contrite spirit, he will not despise. Come as you are. Be honest about your need. 
Well, this is it. She broke it, which means she's cashing it all in. And John tells us when she did this, she also anointed his feet and wiped them with her hair and that the whole house was filled with the aroma. John also tells us that the perfume was thought to be valued around 300 denarii. Denarii is about a, a day's wage. So we're talking about a year's worth of wages. Imagine a year's wage poured out all at once. See, this is quite an act. This is very extravagant. And not everybody is impressed with her generosity. Verse 8, but when his disciples saw it, they were indignant. They said, why this waste? For this fragrant oil might have been sold for much and given to the poor. And in John chapter 12, we find out it was specifically Judas who was indignant about the expense. But boy, they, he sure sounds noble, doesn't he? John also tells us in John chapter 12, verse 6, this he said not because he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief. And he had the money box, and he used to take what was put in it. I remember when Jesus Christ Superstar came out, like 73, maybe, seven, uh, before I was saved. And I remember how Judas was painted as a sincere but confused person in the scene. I'm going to take John's word over Andrew Lloyd Webber's. <laughs> so John is seeing, I mean, I'm sorry, Judas is seeing this money, this ka -ching just going right before him, slipping away. And he's, he's protesting. He said, whoa, whoa, don't you know what, I could, what we could do with 300 denarii? Oh, we could, we could feed a lot of people. We could have helped the poor. And it seems that the other people started joining him in his bandwagon. Once he states that, it's like, wow, that is pretty, that's a lot there. They, it, so they criticize her. Well-intentioned, perhaps, but dead wrong. And I wonder if you or I were there, if we would have been drawn into that. Like, Mary, whoa, what, is that your dowry? Is that your, your future, your security? You, you, you're, just, you, you're, you're doing that? See, it's hard for the people in the world to comprehend a person willing to give up all of her dreams for the sake of following Jesus because following Jesus becomes her dream. It's an act of true worship here. The act of worship doesn't consist in the songs that we sing on Sunday morning, although that's part of our worship. Don't misunderstand me. Worship consists of the things that we do, the things that we give, the things we do out of our love for Him. We give Him what we are, what we have, who we are. Here's an interesting, a little food for thought. The, the word translated for waste here in verse 8 when they're saying, this is, why are you wasting this? The word there is apollia. Last week we focused on a word that was closely related, same root here, but it's worth noting that the same word, apollia, is translated as perdition in John chapter 17, verse 12, when Jesus calls Judas the son of perdition. It's the same word. In other words, Judas criticizes Mary for wasting money, but Judas, in turn, wastes his entire life. And I wonder how many people are doing the same thing. Who even think they're close to Jesus. Think they're in control, running the show. Have a plan or scheming. And in the end they find out they're wasting their life. It was in vanity. Mary gave lavishly. She gave lovingly. She was not ashamed to show her love for Christ openly. And she was criticized because of that. Isn't that the way it goes? I mean, isn't that what happens 
I mean, some people get it and some don't. You've heard it. Hey, I'm really glad you found Jesus and all. That good for you. I'm glad it works for you. I think that's great. It's nice to see you're happy and look at you. You yeah, quit drugs. Hey, that's wonderful. You know, but you know, don't take it too far. You know, you guys get a, a little too excited about this whole thing. Meanwhile, you know, you're watching the game and it's like, oh, the Red Sox are beating the Yankees. Yes! You guys get excited over the wrong things. You See, the people around us may not understand our desire to be extravagant with Jesus. It makes no sense to them. They don't understand why you'd be willing to give up your week of vacation to go on a mission trip. It makes no sense to them. It's like, you don't even want to drink at the wedding? But it's an open bar. But they don't understand. Maybe it's, you know, taking your resources and blessing other people as they watch you do that. You went to a spaghetti dinner fundraiser and you gave how much for a plate of spaghetti? See, in the world, it just doesn't seem wise. So you actually give 10% of your money away? No, I give more. What? Why? Maybe it's lifting your hands, right? And when you're praising the Lord and thanking your king, people are, where's your dignity, man? Please, my point is, don't let any of the critics stop you from lavishing love on Jesus. Amen. That's my point. And I know it's easy to do. So now they're railing on her. And you know, I wonder if she's beginning to question herself. After all, this is a huge sacrifice. And no one's saying, you go girl. They're all like, what are you doing? This is crazy. Have you ever let other people make you second guess yourself? Don't be the person that makes someone who genuinely loves Jesus second guess themselves. Don't be that person. Verse, but, but meanwhile, Jesus understands what's going on. Verse 10, when Jesus was aware of it, he said to them, why do you trouble the woman? For she has done a good work for me. See, he calls her act of devotion a good work. They thought that her worship was wasteful. Jesus sees it as beautiful. And I also like how she doesn't defend herself. She just lets Jesus do it. And there's a very valuable lesson right there. Verse 11, For you will have the poor with you always, but me you do not have always. Now, he's not showing heartlessness to the poor. His compassion for the poor is all throughout the Gospels. He's encouraged others to meet their needs many times. Remember the rich young ruler? And sell all you have. Give it to the poor. He wants people to give freely. He wants people to give of their own volition. A giver's motive is known only to God. If you really care about the poor, you're going to have many opportunities throughout life to help them. If you really care, it'll be evident by the life that you live. It's not like there's a lack of hurting people around us if you want to be a blessing to them. But there will never be another opportunity here to show this love and this honor to Jesus prior to the cross. Listen to what Jesus says, verse 12. For in pouring this fragrant oil on my body, she did it for my burial. It's like, what? Could it be? That Mary caught a glimpse of what the disciples couldn't see? That Jesus was about to die? Could it be that she intended this gift, this preparation for burial? It, it, it seems it could be. Certainly she's on track way ahead of others. 
Perhaps Jesus, Mary understood a little more about Jesus' fate, even if the disciples didn't. How could she be in tune on the same frequency? How could she know? Well, I think she understood because she was often found at the place of the greatest understanding, right? She's at the feet of Jesus. That's where she would hang out. That's where she would be. One of the great teachable moments God gave me, and I know I share this a lot, but it really impacted me, was when my daughter, my firstborn, was about a year old. And she was in the other room, and she said with a, a bit of urgency, Dada! And I said, I'm over here, Crystal, by the couch. And she crawls over. And she sits at my feet, and I'm looking at her. And then she just goes off into her little la-la vacation world. And I'm look, looking at her thinking, what? And then it hit me. She didn't want something from me. She just wanted to know where I was so she could be at my feet. And as a dad, that was one of the most beautiful experiences I ever had when I connected the dots. And I realized, like, so often people get jammed up when they're praying. They're like, I, I, I get this cosmic stage fright. You know, it's like I, I open the doors to the King of Kings and it's like, uh, I don't know what to say. You don't have to say anything. Because as a father, I know. The realization that as a child you just want to be at his feet is one of the most beautiful things a father can experience. All you need is a desire to be at his feet to pray. And at his feet is where you're going to learn so much. We get a little awkward in our prayer life, especially when things go silent. Like we, you know, isn't it the weirdest thing how we have a hard time waiting in the Lord like that? It's like, we'll go to a theme park and we'll stand 45 minutes in line for a three-minute thrill ride. But five minutes before the Lord, we get really little squirmy when we have a hard time. Mary gave Jesus the love and the attention he should have been getting just before that time of great suffering. In Mark chapter 14, verse 8, on the same... Is same event. Jesus said, She has done what she could. She has come beforehand to anoint my body for burial. She has done what she could. What a line. She's done what she... Do you think Jesus could say that about you? Oh, you've done what you could. What a beautiful testimony. You know, God expects no more from you than what we can do. And he knows exactly what it is. Verse 13, Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world that this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. And I guess I'm helping fulfill that prophecy today. Now, as we glance at our fourth and final scene, we're going to go from one end of the spectrum to the other. From the pure devotion of Mary to the slippery sun of perdition. From the sweet smell of worship to the stinky stench of a rat. Then, verse 14, one of the twelve called Judas Iscariot went to the chief priest and said, What are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? And they counted out to him thirty pieces of silver. So from that time, he sought opportunity to betray him. There was no noble intent in Judas's heart. His motive was money. And his price wasn't too high. Thirty pieces of silver... That's the redemption price of a slave in the book of Exodus, chapter 21, verse 32. And it's also subtly prophesied as the price of the rejected shepherd in Zechariah eleven twelve. Mark and Luke both tell us that these people were greatly pleased when Judas approached them. To them it must have seemed like answered prayer. 
What a contrast between Mary and Judith to this. In life, we have givers and takers. Mary is concerned about giving extravagantly to Jesus. Judas is concerned about getting what he can from Jesus. Which one are you? Which one would you rather be more like? Now, don't misunderstand me. There's a place in all of our lives where we need to simply come and receive from the Lord. Right? I understand that. Uh, there's a time when we have to receive from others. I get it. But my point is, if that characterizes your entire life, if what you are all about is getting, then something is wrong. Because as we grow as a believer, being a part of the Christian community is about learning to give to the Lord, giving to other people in the church, giving to those in the world. When you come to church, are you coming to see what you can get out of it? Because a lot of people do. That's, they come to church. Well, essentially, it's like, okay, preacher, you got 35 minutes to bless me. Go. Right? And they'll, they'll determine how things went by how blessed they felt. So it's either an amen or an ouch. If it's, an, if it's an amen, it's like, oh man, I was blessed. If it's an ouch, if, if, if the Holy Spirit pushed on that bruise, pff, not going there again. <laughs> See? That's, what that's what happens when you come with the mindset to get. Or are we coming to give? What if the person next to you last week you found out, tried to take their life. You'd be like, if only I had known. Well, maybe, maybe he wanted to talk to you. Maybe you seemed a little focused on other things. See, sometimes we come here with a mindset. Gail Irwin used to put it this way. He'd say, are you a fountain or a black hole? Right? Because some people come to church like a black hole. They just suck up all the energy. And it's all about what can go into them. And other people come like a fountain. They come in here. They look people in the eye when they talk to them. And how are you doing? There's a little depth to them. They find out where they're hurting. They pray for them. Sometimes they tell them that they're praying for them. Sometimes they don't. Some people, they, they come in and, and they just want to draw. Other people are like, I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. I want that living water to just saturate everyone around me. Sometimes people come to church and they're looking to see if anyone will talk to them. But they're not willing to reach out to other people. Oh, that church is cold. Nobody would talk to me. It's like, who did you talk to? Nobody. Oh. Are you like one of those in the house where we're enjoying the sweet fragrance, the smell of that perfume? It's like when Jesus broke it open, or when Mary broke it open on Jesus, everybody could smell it. And sometimes those here in the house of God enjoy that sweet smell of the perfume that others have. Or are you one of those extravagant worshipers? breaking your own alabaster box, staining yourself and Jesus with that perfume. Does the perfume even go home with you? It's my prayer that we could all learn to love Jesus like Mary does. And when the people don't understand your zeal, Jesus will know. And he knows that you're doing what you can. Is he your Lord? Lord, we thank you so much. We thank you for the opportunities you give us. Every day you give us an opportunity as you ask us the same question. Are you going to trust me today? And Lord, you love us so much. 
and it's your desire that we do not go into eternity in a sin-marred state. For we were created with purpose. And we can be redeemed. We can be bought back. We can be washed white. The world offers all kinds of religions and programs, but they only whitewash. Only Jesus washes white. And we thank you, Lord, that you change us from the inside out. Your Holy Spirit resides in us, convicting us of things, changing us, Lord. And as a result, we end up bearing fruit, not striving to work to gain favor, but bearing fruit because we love you so much and you're working through us. Lord, I pray that we would be willing to worship you extravagantly. And by that I mean by the laying down of our lives, by realizing nothing is lost compared to what is gained when we are following you. If there's anyone here who has never received Jesus, has never just come to that moment and said, I know that I need a savior. I know that I'm a sinner. And I know that if, if all sin is gonna be judged, I'm in trouble. I know my thought life. I know my desires. And I'm in trouble. And I want to be clean. And I want to be forgiven. And you need to know that you can be. Because that was the purpose. Jesus came to seek and save you. That which was lost. Me. He took the punishment that my sin demands of a holy God and he took it upon himself. As Jesus was being arrested in the garden, he said, take me and let them go. That is the heart of Jesus. And when it came to sin, it's the same thing. He paid the price he didn't know. He paid our price. So now, as a gift of God, we get the righteousness of God. And we can stand before him, though we do not deserve it. We can stand before him blameless. And the scriptures declare, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. So if you've never stepped over that threshold, it's as easy as acknowledging the truth that you are a sinner, that you believe and you know you need to be forgiven. And you understand that is why Jesus went to the cross, to pay the price for your sin. And understanding that he rose again, that sacrifice was accepted by the Father. And you can be imparted with the gift of righteousness by asking, by repenting of your sin, by agreeing with God. For nobody has sabotaged your life as much as you have. But God has a greater plan. So Lord, we thank you. Thank you for your word. You are worthy of all praise and worship. We thank you so much for your Holy Spirit in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.